This is a PAL Sega Mega Drive game. You know this because of the classic logo, the black grid-like bottom and back, which of course is a nice inverted colour scheme to the oh-so-nostalgic Master System game covers of the previous generation. And of course, because it says, for use with the Sega Mega Drive Video Entertainment System. Now, later games may look a little bit different than this, most notably the Blue Spined games, which came in towards the second half of the Mega Drive's life, but for all intents and purposes, let's keep this video old school and talk about the original Mega Drive cases. Moving over to America, we have, for all intents and purposes, the exact same game for the exact same system, but um, yeah, it doesn't take a Pam Beasley to work out that this is not the same picture. Firstly, and most obviously, the design itself is completely different. Sure, you still got your grid-like background, but uh, that's it. You got the far harsher, but dare I say it, more eye-catching Genesis logo. And just in case this video blows up in popularity outside of the retro gaming niche, yeah, these are the same systems. They're just different names for different regions. And just to make it even more confusing, this is the exact same game for the exact same system once again, but for Japan, where again, this system is now called the Mega Drive, and a brand new logo is shown to represent that in that country. However, the biggest change from these two regions is without a doubt, the cartridge itself, which has a far more retro futuristic feel than the other two cartridges. Now I could get into far more technical details here, chatting about the way that early Japanese games had hole punched edges, supposedly so that businessmen could bind them together and read them at work. How the PAL version technically runs at 50 hertz, making the games, including Sonic, run literally slower on those systems compared to Japan and America. And of course, the fact that you would quite literally need to mutilate your cartridge in order to get them to run on other region systems if you imported them or you could just uh, remove the top half of the shell itself on the Mega Drive. Regardless, there are no doubt hundreds of little differences that I haven't mentioned, but these are, cosmetically speaking, uh, the main differences between this one game in all three of the major regions, and you guys no doubt have a particular region that you prefer to collect for. The problem is, it's getting harder and harder to do that thing, because prices are skyrocketing to the point where only the extremely rich can join in by this point, which does make gamers like me, and I'm sure plenty of others out there, sit and think to themselves, what are we doing? Let's be honest, for the most part, these are not the way that I and most other people play these games these days. I mean, on occasion, I may pull it down off the shelf and boot it up, but 99% of the time, even if it's a cartridge I own, I'm probably going to be loading up a ROM or an emulated collection, not only for convenience, but because I want to keep these stunning yet deteriorating pieces of art in the absolute best condition possible. Still, is it going to stop me collecting? No. I'm someone that still likes to collect the oddities in the world, as well as all of the classics that I had as a kid, and display them all trophy-like on the shelf, and that's not going to stop anytime soon. i just got to be more clever with what I decide to collect for and set myself reachable goals. And uh, I may have just found that perfect collection piece to now collect for. Another region that is without a doubt the most oddest in all of the regions. It's the most rare. It's averagely priced for now and completely pointless. And that's why I love it. This is the story of Sega's Indian retro games. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. Now before getting into this odd region of games, let's go back to the beginning and find out how this thing even came to be. 
Back in the early to mid 80s, Sega was in a weird situation. For the most part, the company was on the up and up in regards to all electronic sales, the arcades were building momentum and even Sega's first true home console, the SG-1000, had far exceeded the expectations of the company when it sold 160,000 units in Japan. And as great as that was, it was a drop in the ocean compared to Nintendo's offering, with Sega gleefully claiming that they were losing sales 10 to 1 compared to Nintendo. Sega no Pasokon wa hofuna soft ga tanoshime. Shikamo hard key de 33,800 yen. Sega! Still, it was progress for the company, and after these humble beginnings within the world of home consoles, Sega would release the Mark III, aka the Master System, which again was completely dominated by the Famicom, aka the Nintendo Entertainment System, however that wasn't the case in Europe. In a region that mostly focused on cheap to make and cheap to buy home computer games, the Master System did indeed make a dent in that region, and for the majority of its shelf life it even outsold Nintendo's offering too. Now the main reason for this was because of the way the two systems were marketed and priced in this region, and you could give Sega a big slap on the back, congratulations for doing so well, but quite frankly, it was more Nintendo not knowing what they were doing in regards to pricing and marketing in this region. Are you ready? Is your family ready for the incredible Nintendo Entertainment System? And this firm American slash Japanese mindset was the same outside of Europe too. And one of the most obvious and well-known examples of this was in Brazil. You see, in Brazil during the 80s, the home computer and the home console market were very different. Most notable systems did indeed exist for the time, from the likes of Nintendo and Sinclair among others, but they were not official. If you wanted official products, you could get them if you knew where to look. They did exist, but you would be paying extreme prices due to the heavy tax put on by the government for these items, which they primarily did, to promote electronics to be manufactured within Brazil itself. A lot of companies got around this by setting up shop in Brazil as well, or more often than not, getting another company to rebrand their products officially in that country, and Sega was no different. They had struck a deal with a company called Tech Toy to essentially create official bootlegs, if you will, of the Master System and eventually the Mega Drive, resulting in those now ancient systems becoming easily the most popular consoles ever released, still shifting numbers to this day, thanks to the official backing by Sega themselves. This has resulted in a fourth region to collect for, and even though I personally don't own any Tech Toy games, because this story is quite well known within the world of retro gaming and therefore the prices are quite high, it does open up the question, what other regions are out there? And it turns out that the Indian market is one that very few people in the scene seem to know about. And even though the scarcity of these games are very, very limited, the prices for these collectibles are not as sky high as you may expect. But guys, they are creeping up. So if this is a system that you want to collect for, get in there now whilst you can. So what's the story here then? Well, just like before, as Sega intended to take the world by storm, just like Brazil, it wasn't as easy as shipping boatloads of Sega carts and consoles to every region and then leaving them to get on with it. This, for example, is the Samurai System, Nintendo's attempt at releasing an official NES in India. And yes, it was called Samurai because Samurais come from Japan. It was a very different time. To turn forehand lob down the line. Ooh, what a return! A flying kick and the ninja's down! But here comes the most dangerous obstacle of them all. Will Mario defeat the evil dragon? Look at that giant bird! Iceman's fallen! Climb, Iceman, climb! He's made it! The champion has made it! Samurai, the world's largest selling electronic TV game, now in India. In short, 
It was not a success. Just like before, India's strict rules of buying imported goods and reselling them forbid them to do that exact thing, unless they set up shop in India. Something that they kind of did? They still made the components abroad, but because they were assembled in India, they could get around this big tax hike. The problem was, again, piracy. No matter how much of a tax deduction you got, Nintendo products are going to be sold at Nintendo prices, which is significantly more expensive than what the pirates could churn out. This resulted in the system selling terribly in that region, and even Mr. Mahesh himself, the guy behind this collaboration, although never admitting this, eventually started selling pirated software too in later years to turn a profit. Samurai, the electronic TV game system. And now finally, this brings us to Sega's offering, who already had a firm relationship with an Indian company for their arcade side of the business. Shaw Wallace Electronics was simply an offshoot to a spirits or liquor company, if you will, in India, who were already receiving popular Sega arcade machines in pieces and then assembling them for sale within India for the same reason that Nintendo and a whole heap of other electronic manufacturers were doing too. After the successful little partnership, this brewery set their sights on the console market and did the exact same thing for the Mega Drive. And just like before, although it did sell better than Nintendo's official offering, Sega 2 became the victim of rampant piracy within that region. Ooh, hey kid, what you doing watching this stupid film? Don't you want to have fun playing Sega? Sega? Sega who? Wrong answer, pal. Show him. It's new, it's wild, it's Sega. International Sega TV games are now here from Shaw Wallace. Hey kid! Want some more? Yeah, yeah! Unlock your mind. A few little company changes happened over the years to try and fix this with varying results, but without a doubt the most lucrative part for Sega themselves was the software rather than the hardware sales. In fact, the hardware is extremely easy to come by to this day, as seen here in a video from Damo Monster. What you're actually getting is a Japanese Mega Drive as opposed to a PAL Mega Drive, aka the Superior model, which has been badly modified during that reassembly using a modulator to only run PAL games, which, as we discussed before, are the not as good slower 50Hz versions, so you could run the games in that region, making the best the worst. And when I say that region, I'm surprisingly not just talking about India. According to Sega Retro, a fantastic website for all things Sega by the way, according to Sega, everything east of Europe and west of Japan slash South Korea is classed as Asia. Which is huge, right? Well, yes, but as a lot of these countries are second world or even third world countries, the sales made here are minimal at best. Shaw Wallace in India is really only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to collaborative efforts by Sega during the 90s and heck, they even got the boot too with the contract going to another company called Maze Marketing, meaning that if you have a PAL Asian Mega Drive game like I do, it's going to be virtually impossible to know where it actually originated from. Which is exactly what this is. The absolute textbook definition of a pointless purchase. Something that I have only ever played as a curiosity, but still something that I'm truly happy to own and put on the shelf. Why? Well, just like all PAL games, this one only runs in 50 hertz, meaning that every single other way of playing this game besides the original PAL release is going to be better. 
But still, I love this little game simply because it's so obscure. We already talked about the differences between all three main regions and this is a Frankenstein mashup of all three put together. Firstly, this is, in my opinion, the coolest Mega Drive logo to ever exist. You've got the harsh font types of the Genesis, but it says Mega Drive. It also has the sexy as all hell Japanese logo front and center, and it's gold. This crazy like mashup doesn't just stop with the logo either. Everyone has their own preference as to which cartridge shell is best, but if you ask me, your opinion is wrong unless you choose the original Japanese shell, which this region has also adopted. Although not in this exact instance, as Virtua Racing all look like this due to the extra power needed to actually run it. Regardless, that's the American font type, that's the Japanese and PAL name of the game, the Japanese logo and Japanese shell, the best of all regions, all housed in the the worst 50 hertz version of the game with an origin story going all the way back to a company that sold brandy. What's not to love? So <laughs> yeah, this is what I'm collecting for these days guys. It's so stupidly odd and I can't get enough of it. Simply out of this world, actual VSOP brandy. Hey there guys, thank you all for checking out the video. This is the part of the video where I'd like to give a massive shout out to all of my Patreons, all of my YouTube members uh, for allowing me to make videos like the one you've just seen uh, every single week. And if you guys wanna support the show just like all of these people do, there'll be links down below for you to do just that. But let me just tell you guys right now, the best thing you can possibly do is hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, maybe leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, any of those things. It helps YouTube push us up in the algorithm, which is, more needed than anything else so thank you all so so much uh, if you do any of those things thank you thank you thank you now let's give an extra big thank you to all of the following patrons and youtube members Boots and Pup, The Sneaky Ferret, Ray Blair, Vitas Varnes, Agro Crag, James, The Action Saxon, uh, Christopher Devero, Roll VP, Ashley Philpot, Jay is Manchild, Kalan Bob, uh, Mike Fallon, Nicholas Burtner, Chev Matic, Jabba Al Aden, Benjamin Guy, Man Shovel, Sha uh, Shappy, Aaron Gorman, Big Rico, Richard Aldrich, Shadow Dragon, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, Game Apologist, Dina, Lucas Softel, Intrigued Gaming, Yield Hamburglar, Jeff Mianowski, Solitz Cap. To Roven Army, Jeremy Rodriguez, Tim Lunn, Bram Perez, Gary Pinkett, Go uh, Conrad Constantine, Andrew Dalton, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, Todd Paul Float G, Ryan Burford, Sir Nilsson, The Old Man Cometh, That Gamer, Old Over Jal Zane, Akatimo84, uh, Ataki Teacher, The Ashen Knight, Shade Silence, John Rogers, Matt Jackson, Ian Quell, Arista, uh, Arista Dina81, Mind of the Unsane, and Vike Echo. Thank you all so, so much, everybody for your support. This was such an interesting deep, deep dive to get into this video. And you, if you guys wanna check out any of the places where I got this information, there's gonna be links down below and a couple of YouTube channels that I think you should check out too um, that really go way heavier on this sort of stuff than this short 15 minute video did because it is a heavy, heavy deep dive. Regardless, thank you for uh, watching the video and thank you for supporting however you decide to do that. But until next time, this is DJ Slope signing out and hopefully I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.